my name is Monty Hanson. Uh, I just turned 49 years old, lifelong resident of Texas. Uh, always had an interest in hunting dogs, but didn't get involved with them until later in life. Uh, mostly worked construction on the road was the main reason for that. I've been involved with hunting dogs since the early 2000s when I joined the Texas Dog Hunter Association uh, and volunteered as a member there, which is now defunct. Uh, I was kind of a hang around. I got to see a lot of different dogs uh, work across the state and learn a lot from a lot of good people. I'd like to give a uh, big credit to my mentor, Douglas Mason of Texas Mason Catahoulas, former president of the Texas Dog Hunter Association, who's uh, helped me and literally hundreds of other people and people who don't even know that he's helped him through his work in Austin with legislation. Uh, I got into hog dogging essentially. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, uh, I had a, an idea for uh, re, 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 uh, rehoming pit bulls and bully breeds, I guess is a good term for them, who, uh, who could make catch dogs. Uh, it, it's, 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 I actually found out that it, uh, once I got into the, into the dog hunting world, I found out that that's a common practice. Um, I even did a stint as a volunteer at the infamous Spindle Top, which was the first uh, pit bull specific rescue in America. If anybody wants to read up about that, it's a horror story. I had nothing to do with the actual running of the operation. I was there to help set up the place for about two months before I figured out that the owner, uh, Leah Purcell, was not quite right in the head. So if you have, if you've never read about Spindletop, uh, Sean, that's something good to read about there. All right, all right. So, and that's it. Like I said, I'm actually fairly green in the in the dog hunting world. I've just had some uh, the Texas Dog Hunters Association, like I said, which is now defunct, was a great organization in the fact that it was very social and did a lot of outreach programs. Uh, for guys like me who didn't have a background, uh, most dog hunters come from either a family lineage of people who hunt or they are, grow up in a rural region where it's very predominant. You don't find a lot of guys like me who, and I'm not bragging, you just don't find people who got into it independently because it's so hard. Mm -hmm. to land to hunt is the first thing that you need, mm -hmm. and the majority of Texas land is in private hands. So, um, Really, that's my short history as far as me and uh, my, my getting involved with hog dogging. Um, I like things that make your heart pump. Uh, being from Texas, I grew up surfing hurricanes. I used to box uh, Muay Thai style kickboxing back in the 90s when everybody thought it was a fancy cocktail. Nobody had heard of it. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I like stuff that makes you, I like, you know, I like stuff that makes your heart pump, Sean. And when right. I got a little bit older, I said, I said, well, I'm going to get I'm going to try to get back into hog dogging now, now that I'm not working construction on the road. And uh, I started getting into it. Uh, Recontacted Mr. Mason again, started working dogs with him, and I had always heard of these Texas Terriers through the grapevine. There was just a, just an under, uh, just a, just a, a rumor through the, through the. You never really seen a whole lot about them. But the, anytime you spoke about little dogs back then, Jags were just making their first, uh, some of their first appearances in Texas, and uh, anytime that little dogs come up, Texas Terriers, the word Texas Terriers come up. So I decided to do a little bit of digging, and then that's where my story with those guys and uh, Doc Smith takes off. The Texas Terrier were. Um, a breeding uh, project started by a man named uh, Robert Red Guthrie, uh, who was living in the Big Bend region of West Texas, which is a very dry, rough desert country. And he was a hunter and a trapper. And he uh, he had a, a treeing walker coon hound, which accidentally bred with a neighbor's uh, papered schnauzer. And all of the pups out of this litter were outstanding hunters. So what Red did is he kept the stud dogs from this breeding, and there was a line of fox terriers that whose name I have not been able to, to discover yet, but there was a line of fox terriers that were being used in the Big Bend country as trap line dogs at the time. And so uh, uh, I can give a brief explanation of what a trap line dog is here in a minute. Um, so anyway, Red had took the stud dogs from this accidental, breed, accidental breeding of the paper schnauzer and the tring walker, and he took those male dogs and put them over females from this gritty line of fox terriers now what a, what a trap line dog is sean is um people who trap for fur don't uh they don't make a solid uh hold for their traps what they do is they place them on what's called a drag which is usually a large piece of wood or a heavy chain so that the animal when trapped he doesn't sit there and fight the trap and and hurt himself and uh ruin his hide he actually runs and leaves a drag what a trap line dog does is he works with the trapper running his trap route and basically saves the trapper time tracking these drags he once a trap line dog runs it learns its, its job a trap line dog saves the trapper hours of work in the field because they're just working ahead of the trapper and if the traps if the trap has been sprung and moved the trap line dog is on it and if the trap is empty the trap line dog is on to the next trap and which allows the trapper to uh 
uh, you know, to, 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 fit, to rebate and reset that trap if necessary. So anyway, Red had taken these, these dogs, bred them over these female fox terriers, and that was the first quote-unquote get of the Texas terriers. And these dogs were great, but Red wanted them a little more gritty because he wanted them to be able to use to uh, actually engage predators like raccoons and uh, even uh, further on down the line, he would use them to hunt hogs and packs. So to accomplish this, and once again, this is back in the, uh, I think this is, this right now we were probably uh, up into the early 90s, Red acquired some Patterdale uh, male dogs and brought them in and studded them into the Texas Terriers, which provided the grit he needed, and the dogs were pretty much a set type and then There's a smooth coat and a rough coat, and there's some variance in the rough coat. Sometimes you'll get a little bit shorter, coarser-haired rough coat and a little bit longer smooth coat, but basically two types, a short coat and a rough coat. And occasionally there would be a red phenotype, uh, which I'll um, I'll send you pictures of. But at this point, in do- at this point in time, the dog coats were a singular color. They were not the black and tan that they are now. This came about due to um, probably right about the beginning of the 2000s. The dogs started to lose size. And the dogs normally are about a 15 to 17 inch dog between 20 and 30 pounds conditioned, and they had started to lose a little bit of size. And to remedy this, what Red did is he sought out some Welsh Terriers and Lakeland Terriers, uh, had them brought out, bought these bought these paper dogs, and he had an American Staffordshire Terrier that was this farm dog named Junk. And Junk was just an all-around great jam-up dog. He studied uh, Junk over these Welsh and Lakeland Terriers, selected the best hunters from those dogs, and studied them back into the Texas Terriers in the early 2000s, which is where we get the current uh, the current the current type that we're at right now which is a, uh, a long and smooth haired coat that is uh, black and tan same thing we have the, we've got the size back that we wanted now um dogs are between once again they're between 15 and 17 inches uh in 20 to 30 pounds conditioned and uh they have they're suitable to any to almost any task in the field they're a bit too big for a ratter but i'm sure they do the job uh, they they don't they're too big to go to to go to ground in the holes. Although they will pursue game to a den and quarry and attempt to dig it out, they're not gonna they're, they're obviously not gonna go down a hole. But as far as um, a trap line dog or an open an open an open field dog, uh, you can't beat them. They're a natural throat dog. They um, and they also have a handle on them. They are very uh, they're very they they desire human companionship. I was not a, I, I got be honest with you sean i was not a little dog fan and i've been around jags and other dogs like that but i was not a little dog fan until i met these guys the handle that the the the, the time that red took in selecting his stud dogs is is so evident in the handle that these dogs have i'll give an example doc's pack that he hunts with the marx brothers which are all male dogs that have been neutered off of a similar breeding two times he selected some of the males that he didn't feel were stud quality and neutered them for a hunting pack uh those guys are just, uh, they're amazing. I introduced my bulldog to them in the field first time, off the bat, running, hunting, no problems, no problems whatsoever. Uh, you could, like I say, these these dogs are just, uh, there's they're something to be seen. I wish you could make it down here to Texas and, and, and see them, Sean. You know, they, like I say, they work trap lines, squirrels, uh, coon dogs. Uh, some people use them for guardians for their, uh, for their chicken yard. They'll pin the chickens up. And then and outside that have a smaller gate, have a smaller fencing area around it. And I guarantee you they don't, they don't lose any chickens, but at the same time, you know, they're a working dog. They're not for everybody. We do have them come back from time to time. We have a dog Tebow right now who has been returned from a previous owner. It was just too much for him. Makes a great dog in the field though. He's a, he's a natural throat dog. The first time he's seen a hog as well, he was right on the face of it. Um, docs, like I was, I was getting back to earlier about the handle on these dogs, Sean, Doc's dogs are probably some of the last dogs you'll see in America hunting hogs that do not use GPS tracking collars or even radio telemetry collars because they're close range hunters, two to 300 yards. And Doc has them all trained with a whistle. They recall and get ahead and get out with the whistle. It's amazing. It's like I said, you probably won't. Be, I don't, I, I've never seen anything like that. And I don't know if anyone else running a pack of dogs like that in America. Yeah. And Doc actually inherited these dogs from red. He was a very good friend of red. And when red passed on, he uh, he willed these dogs to Doc, along with the registry and everything else that goes to them. They were great hunting partners. Doc's got a, a, a hundred good stories about them hunting. Uh, they lived out in the San Saba region of Texas, along the San Saba River, the, the Pecan Valley, excuse me, Pecan Bio area. 
which is just straight Comanche country, you know. Mm. It's on uh, the edge of the hill country, rocky stuff, cactus and rattlesnake everywhere. And uh, people will be amazed that a pack of four to five of these little guys can bay up a 200, 250 pound boar, but they can. They are uh, they are very they're as smart as they are gritty. Once they learn, if they the, don't get me wrong, the learning curve is pretty harsh. But once they get over that learning curve, and, and they're just you know they're just amazing. Um, only thing we're having an issue with them right now is we've got a, a bumper crop of porcupines in Texas this year, and we've run into two of them so far. We did some aversion training the last time after our incident. But uh, another thing, no sedation necessary. Most dogs that run into porcupines with this level of quills in the face, they've got to go get sedated to have them pulled out. We pulled out the majority of these quills by hand, and the only one that really required the dogs to be somewhat restrained were the ones that were inside the roof of their mouth. So the handle on them, is, Sean, is just outstanding, like I said. I was not a little dog fan until I met these guys. When you lo- when you go to load them up, they just roll uh, – they, they practically roll belly up for you and let you pick them up and load them in the crate. It's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. Uh, state trappers, as a matter of fact, used to uh, – Red used to make quite a <clears> – <throat> He was known for fur trappers and state and state uh, employed trappers who use these dogs for trap line dogs. Just because, like I said, once they a dog who is smart enough to know the difference that it can bay up a hog or a rat or a bobcat on a trap line and not engage it is the same dog that will engage a raccoon or a red fox or a gray fox one on one and go straight for the throat. And you know, it, like I said, they're as gritty as they are smart. They make up. Uh, if handled by the proper handler and raised correctly and socialized and exposed correctly, they can be your, your truck dog, your house dog as well. It is just, you know, the right type of owner is necessary, which is why now we're very, very, very exclusive about who we place these dogs in, into whose hands we place these dogs. We have a small circle of trust, uh, Jake, Harley, guys that are out there in the Brownwood, Abilene area. Also, um, a guy named Jeremy Nudson from North Star Kennels who uh, is down here in Texas now. He's responsible for helping educate me about Patterdales and things like that. The smaller dogs. I had no real education of how to work them. So between Doc and Jeremy of North, of North Star Kennels, I've been learning about working terriers. I had no terrier experience before this, but I'm I'm a convert now. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know if you've ever been around Sean, but I'm a convert now, these little guys. How would you compare uh, a Jag and a Patterdale to a Texas terrier? And what are some of the, the qualities that you like better about the Texas Terrier? Well, uh, to me, they have a little bit more of an of an off switch than a Patterdale and a, and, a, and a Jag. Patterdales and Jags are so on fire all the time, and don't get me wrong, there's some top, there are some few top notch handlers out there who can, but you have to, you know, they are, they're gonna, they're just, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna hunt what they, what they, what they come across relatively. Now, the Texas Terriers can can be the same way, but. I feel that from what I've seen from them, you can actually, if you start out early enough with them, you can really get them focused on a specific, on what they're running in, in specifics, you know. And uh, uh, I don't know how how hard Jags and uh, Patterdales are to stock break. I'll give you an example of that, stock breaking, as far as not harassing livestock in the field. I don't know how, how big of a problem that is for terrier men hunting these guys, uh, but because I assume they're just, you know, they're just placing dogs at dens and running dogs in dens, but we can run the Texas Terriers through a field of cattle or horses with docks, whistles, commands, and it's it, it's not an issue. You know, we don't we're not we're not worried about damaging the livestock, and that is a big issue down here in Texas. Most of the places I have permission to hunt are because, and I don't unfortunately, like I said, I don't have any any dog any of the Texas terriers down here. I hunt cur, a cur dog down here with my bulldog, and all the places I have to hunt are because my dogs are stock broke, which is why I'm allowed to bring my dogs to Doc's place, and I can run them with the Texas terriers because they're not going to gang up and go harass docks horses or his cattle or get off property chasing someone else's horse or cattle um as far as that like i said that's probably one of the you know other than the fact that they're not an earth dog a true earth dog you know a terrier in the sense of the word that they don't they don't they do not they do not go to ground uh for the majority of the part i mean i'm sure if the hole was big enough don't get me wrong they would go after it uh i think they're a little bit more apt to bay up than a Patterdale or maybe a Jag, as far as, like I said, being gritty smart. I don't know how a Patterdale would do if he encountered a Bobcat on a trap line. I think a Patterdale would most likely probably try to engage it immediately, which could result in his demise. You know, I've seen Patterdales, <laughs> I've seen Patterdales do some stuff that just defied even my expectations. You know, I watched one, one of them get launched 15 foot in the air by a horse, and I was for sure he was dead. But um, he wasn't. And in that, Sean, as I would say, that you can. You can train these guys to run in a pack 
and you can you, they have a little bit more of a as like I said before a little bit more of a handle on them than uh then I feel like that you have that, that is attainable maybe with a Jag or uh, a Patterdale, you know, yeah, a little bit more, a little bit, like I said, a little bit more of a handle, a handle on it. But don't, like I said, don't even know. They are, uh, they are dead game gritty. I can go through Red Stud book and uh, most of his studs have perished in races with hogs or getting crushed by them or uh, being drowned by borkoons. You know, that's the, the most common end for his stud dogs. Almost all of his stud dogs died in the field. Uh, like I said, that's that's about the, the the main difference I can see though, Sean, is the fact that they are probably as smart as they are gritty, you know. Right. And they are, and, and and but they don't get me wrong. I said they have just as much grit as anything else. But other than that, and and the, and the ability to work in a pack if conditioned in a pack. Uh, the the one I told you about, the horse that launched him, <laughs> he had literally been around that horse on a lead, um, and was very very. Um, on a lead, you could correct him and get him to disengage where he's not acting. You know, he's not uh, on the end of the lead. Try- he, he really showed minimal interest in the horse on the end of the lead. Now, what happened was is that horse had wandered into a paddock where the dogs were going, and we didn't know that he was in there. Dog got released and seen the horse and said, well, hey, why not? <laughs> now, what's funny is the female, uh, the female Patterdale, she healed and recalled immediately, came back. Right. But, but the male just decided he was going to have a go at it. The horse launched him in the air. He hit the ground, got up, dusted himself off, and to his uh, to his credit, recalled after that. I guess he thought better of the situation. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, um, my 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 mentor, Mister Mason, had uh, acquired a Jag as a as a truck dog and to maybe use as a puppy trainer. But he uh, for cur dog style, it was ex- it was exactly the opposite that you wanted. The, the Jag was just way too rough and ready to engage the hog which is not what you want to teach a young cur dog for a, a puppy. And he actually uses, believe it or not, he uses those little, uh, he uses a bench-legged feist as his puppy trainer because they've got just enough gumption to go in there and bay at a small hog and nip at it, but they won't really engage it, which is exactly how you want it to bring a, a stock-minded cur dog up anyway. Interesting. So, yeah. I, sorry to get off on a tangent about cur dogs there, but that's, like I said, that's my other world that I fool around in. Well, at the moment, what we're doing is... Um, the mo- uh, at the moment, we're, we're, we just reacquired, uh, talk about reacquiring dogs, we just reacquired two more dogs, and we're planning breedings at the moment. We just had a confirmation of a successful breeding right now. Uh, Jake, out of uh, in Buffalo Gap that I mentioned, he has a, a really good stud dog uh, by the name of Boomer. He's a guy who hunts and traps up that way. And uh, right now, that's, that's really what we're doing is we're looking to expand our circle of trust and find... You know, um, even if you're not as experienced a hunter, if you have the ability to work these dogs, if you have a place where you can work them and you're currently working dogs, you have some experience, you know, we will, we would probably, you know, we'd probably consider someone, but we're just very, um, very particular about, you know, who, who we put these dogs hand, hands into because uh, for one, the bloodlines are very, are somewhat limited at the moment. But we're we're looking to expand that. We've had a couple of a couple of really good litters now, and the dogs are really uh, are really showing up. The way uh, I'll give you an example: Boomer is exactly he's 17 inches at the wither at the at the shoulder, and he's just under just under 30 pounds condition. And man, when you put your hand on him, he feels like a like a little English staffy. Underneath that that wiry coat mm-hmm. is just is just a cobby brick like body that's solid all the way through. Um, I go out there and I, I exercise them sometimes on the flirt pole to get them to working. Uh, some we'll, we'll, we'll kind of work dogs together in pairs on the flirt pole to get them to see, to get them to work together on the flirt as opposed to competing, see how dogs work together. You know, you, you follow me, Sean, there? Yeah. yeah. So I use, I use a flirt pole to get them to, to pursue this and not to compete for it. And on the flirt pole, these Texas Terriers are just, uh, you can feel them on the end of that, on the end of that flirt. They have a little, just killing jaw strength, really. Like I say, they do. They're they're capable of, of one out coon dogs, and they're just natural throat dogs. So they they you know and that's the thing about a that's the thing about a coon dog is they've got to engage fast and kill that animal before it causes them damage. And also, it's it's the most humane way to go about it, and it's the way that protects the, the hide, the fur most, which is the goal of that. There, you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, they're. Um, I'll see if I can find red. I've got a picture somewhere. It's an older picture. The quality's not too well, but Red actually had a um, a red fox that was in his chicken yard, and he had his Texas Terrier run out, grab the grab the fox by the throat, and simply wouldn't release it. He had to go find a break. He had to carry the fox back up to the house about 100 yards to get a break stick. But like this, when they take a job, they take it absolutely 100 percent 
and 10 percent serious all day long every day mm-hmm. they're always on they're always on the job but like i say um you know jake's uh jake's dog boomer that's his truck dog that goes to work with him every day uh doc's dog tt she's his house dog she has the run of the ranch you know and at the same point in time like i said these dogs are, are dead gate are, are dead game gritty i've seen tt uh you know she knows she can't mess with the horses she knows she can't mess with the stock but i've seen her snatch a uh, uh, stalk a quail into a bush and snag it out of the air you know <laughs> like I said, these dogs are amazing mm-hmm. That's the only thing that we haven't done with them is try to make them retrievers. I think they're a little too hard mouthed to retrieve. I've seen some people that have retrieving uh, retrieving jags, believe it or not. Really? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so uh, how many how many people are involved in um, in the, the the breeding program? Uh, right now, it's right now the circle of trust, like I said, is pretty close. It's uh, me, Doc, me and Doc Smith are running the registry, and then we've got three hunters at the moment right there that have dogs. Uh, so it's, like I say, it's, it's right now, and and that's 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 including the three that I know. I think Doc may have dogs placed with two or three other people. So we're talking about there's probably less than a dozen people right now that that have a hold of these dogs, mm-hmm. you know. And that's the, our goal, Sean, is to is to get you know the awareness of them is kind of out there, and if we can get people who will hunt them, you know, because we don't want a repeat of what's going through, like you say, with the Patterdales right now. Patterdales are so hot, and everyone they just think they're the almost awesome dog, and they want them. And we don't, you know, I'll put it to you this way: we we don't. I don't know if you know about that incident in England, but we don't want a Texas Terrier killing a seal or anything, <laughs> making a name for itself. Right. You know, they're just not. They're they're so cute. They're very so cute and very personable that people would a lot of people think, oh, this would make a great dog for me, and it is. But if you don't have an experience with a working breed that has a real drive that it needs to fulfill, it's not, you know it's not the dog for you. You need to find a dog with a companion temperament. Mm-hmm. You know, and not not that these dogs don't have a companion element, but it's not their primary purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to they have to be sociable. They have to be you know handleable. Uh, you know, we have to you know we have to pull. Uh, like I said, we had to pull porcupine spines out of them, you know, and uh, cactus thorns from between their paws. Mm-hmm. On a daily basis, we can't run them to the vet for stuff like that. So they have to they have to have a handle bred into them. But um, we don't want to lose what what Red uh, created. We don't want his efforts, his all this hard work to go to waste because he created such a wonderful a wonderful dog type. This you know, we're not ready to call it a breed just yet because we, they're not registered. We run them in our own registry. I mean, I guess the term is ambiguous type re, uh, type or breed, whatever. Uh, Red was actually looking into registering the dogs was and exploring his options with several different registration organizations. He just hadn't found uh, hadn't really found any that he agreed with 100. percent I don't think so. Mm-hmm. He just started his you know kept his own registry and his own paperwork, which is what I, part of what I'm doing right now. I have boxes and boxes of stuff in front of me, which are pedigrees and letters, and he shipped dogs to as far away as Hawaii, which is amazing to me. Uh, all over the Midwest. Like I say, one of these dogs uh, had made a great uh, reputation for itself as a as a, as a coon dog um, up in Kansas. Um, no one had ever seen this dog before and just couldn't believe that this dog was capable of the, the type of work that it was. And uh, we're just hoping to preserve this legacy and expand it and build on it, which is part of the reason why we're rebranding the name as the as the Guthrie uh, Terrier, maybe as the, well, maybe excuse me as the Guthrie Terrier as opposed to the Guthrie Texas Terrier or the Texas Terrier. We're we're probably just considering to, to drop the we may, we may keep the Texas in there as part of the legacy factor of it, but, um, you know, we just want everybody all over America to, and, and for a rural, like I say, for a rural person who needs a working dog, an all around house dog, it, it, it would be hard, you know, as long as you're not, as long as you don't need to round up your stock, it's probably the, it's probably hands down one of the, the best dogs. This dog is going to, it's going to protect your yard from everything from a mouse, you know, to a fox. I mean, I'd hate to see one engage a coyote one-on-one. We've never actually lost any to coyotes because we run them in packs and we always run them with at least one, if not two, running catch dogs for hogs. So we've never had an issue with coyotes. But um, like I said, uh, you know, everything other than that, they're just about hands down, they're hard to beat. Mm-hmm. But like I say, we have a small circle of trust on purpose just because in the past Reddit had dogs, um, you know, that he had sold to people with the promise of is this dog is not a stud quality or breeding quality, you know, you'll neuter it. People took him and bred him and crossed him and things like that. And I don't know if any of those types of dogs are out there, but as far as the last pure of his bloodlines that are out there, there's a, there's a small circle of us, about a dozen or so, that are involved in this at the current time. Maybe It might not even be a dozen. 
um, Sean. You know, it might be about, it might maybe eight, nine, ten guys. Like I say, it's real close. One of them is Doc's uh, farrier, his horseshoer. <laughs> Not to get bottlenecked, are you guys reintroducing certain breeds to keep the percentages well, up? And, yeah. and we're eva- it's, it's funny you mentioned that, Sean. You know, we're uh, I'll open up to you a little bit here. We're evaluating that at the current at the point in time. That's actually why I started uh, looking into Patterdales because the Patterdale is such an integral part of the breed. We're looking into making some crosses with the Texas Patter of the Texas terriers into the patterdales and then if those dogs are suitable and they're what we want we would back cross them into the back into the bloodline the only issue uh, that we do have with the uh, getting bottlenecked right now the one of the few genetic faults is that we we do have uh, sometimes we have some small litters which is another reason um you know when i say small we'll get you know a two you know a two two to three pup litter you know at a max and uh it's it's one of the things we, we need to increase fertility, but we don't want to lose anything. So we're looking at we're looking at some back crosses into the Patterdale, but once again, that'll all be taken and heavily evaluated. It's nothing that's nothing that's immediate, and it, and it won't be anything that, that we release to the public. You know, we, we most likely won't be. Uh, and I say we're not going to try to market these things. Is what I'm saying. If there's right. a hunter that wants to try one of these dogs, and um, and that's what that's what, that's our deal is that um, if you take a if you if you own a Texas Terrier like Jake, he's part of the program, so his you know, his, his, he, he's putting his dog up to be accessible to anyone else at any point in time if we feel like there's going to be a potential uh, breeding that his dog will be uh, suited for. And that's the same, that would be the same thing with these Patterdale Terrier crosses, these uh, Patterdale uh, Guthrie Terrier crosses if we do them. They're going to remain within the circle and they're going to be used for, uh, for reinvigoration of the, of the female side of the genetics to see if we can get up to three and consistent three and four pup litters is what mm-hmm. we'd like. But like I say, other um, that is that's the only crosses that we have planned at the moment. Um, is we like I said, we've got we've acquired some some Patterdales from some really good hunting bloodlines, some various hunting bloodlines, and we're evaluating them as we speak right now. You know, we haven't uh, no no breedings have been planned for those dogs as of yet. We're still evaluating them, and um, but that is our plans because we um we are a little bit tight with the blood, and we do need to we do need to. Uh, it's, it's, there's got to be some some solution there. We just don't want to add anything that we don't want, and we and, right. uh, we don't want to diminish too much in size. So we really had to ser- search hard to find us some uh, Patterdales that weren't outcrossed to to any bullies, any bully breeds, some true Patterdales that were a, a little bit larger variety. And like I said, once again, uh, Jeremy Nutson from North Star Kennels was very helpful with that. Mm-hmm. But that's our plans at the moment, Sean, is to uh, evaluate that for a back for a back cross once we once we make the initial F ones, which is similar to what Red did uh, when he wanted to uh, change the coat color and to up the size in the dogs when he was losing size. Mm-hmm. I think that his uh, his breeding efforts just got cut a little bit short and hampered by his uh, ailing health and his age, his poor health and his old age. Mm-hmm. So we're going to try to follow some of his recipes and see what comes out of that, but. We do a lot of pen testing, a lot of field testing, and um, like I say, these dogs only go to working homes, so mm-hmm. we're only, you know, we're results results oriented. I mean, we the, the price for these dogs uh, is not even that high because once again, we know the expense of owning hunting dogs and what it takes, you know. So we're not looking to place them in the hands of dog fanciers, one because they don't deserve them, and two because the dog itself would not be fulfilled in living that type of lifestyle. But these dogs were bred for the they 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 crave the field they crave uh, to be in the woods. Uh, we're, we're we're waiting the, on the results of these females to see how they how they line out, and that's that's where I'm learning some more about. Like like we said, I don't have much experience with the Jags, but I have a little bit more experience with them with the Patterdales than I do with the Jags, and that's where my comments about the off switch came from. Our Patterdales, Sean, uh-huh. grab a scu- We had a, our Patterdales, two of them on opposite sides, two of them that were kenneled next to each other managed to grab a skunk i don't know how they did it outside of the kennel fence that it got over the containment fence and into the kennels they grabbed it through the wire one on one side and one on the other side and just stretched it between the two oh my gosh <laughs> and that's when i just knew that wow these guys yeah like i said they are uh people ask me what a patterdale terrier is and my personal description of them is that's about 17 pounds of fire on four legs right Tebow is a dog that was returned to us, a neutered uh, male dog that was returned, had been a house pet for about four years. As the dog I told you, we introduced him into the, to hogs in the field. Yeah, his hunter uh, runs him on a trap line as well. But um, he had a, ra- uh, a rattlesnake incident. A rattlesnake 
made his way into his keep, his kittle. He killed it, Sean, and he took a bit bite to the head. But he obviously wasn't feeling too bad after the incident because he ate the rattles off the thing. Oh, we didn't even get to we didn't get to keep him. And he's had a second incident. He killed one. He killed one a few days ago. I think last week. Uh, he killed one at a gate crossing with him and Doc, him and Jake. They were coming back from a hunt. He ran in there and snatched it, pulled it out before Jake could even do anything. Wow. Which is typical of a dog that has had a run in with a snake like that. You would think that you would think that they learn, you know, to dis- about discretion, but it, it seems like that it makes them hate them even more. You know? <laughs> right. Wow. Which is what we're trying to avoid with porcupine with porcupines. You know, we're working on some aversion training with that. Uh-huh. That's just that's no fun, and and they are on the rise in Texas. I don't know if it's uh, what what the deal is. If it's just a bumper a bumper year for them, but um, there seems to be more and more encounters between dogs and porcupines, which is not no one's favorite. No, we're actually looking. It's funny. Uh, the last meeting we had, we talked about um, DNA profiling. Um, I don't know if that's if that's exactly what you're talking about, Sean. Mm-hmm. Is DNA profiling? Um, Jake is actually taking a look into that into Boomer, and we thought about. We thought about uh, working backwards through the bloodline and doing that, but I just don't know uh, cost prohibitive things like that. But um, as far as health issues, I mean, uh, Doc had a dog that was what was she? Uh, Tessie was golly, 12, 13 years old, and she perished from. I think she had uh, she had an internal tumor that was a little bad. But and every once in a while, we'll get one with a little bit of skin issues. But other than the, you know, the slightly low fertility, there's not a lot of a lot of health issues with these with these guys. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, Red, uh, Red was an old time breeder who culled very heavily. And I say he he was very critical about dogs. I've seen records of just dogs and dogs that he's brought in that didn't make the cut for the breeding program. He imported, like I said, he uh, imported several uh welsh terriers and several lakelands that didn't make the cut they just you know although they looked apart the they were not suitable for what he wanted to put in the bloodlines and uh, i'm sure the same went through for, through for most of his breeding program he was also bred plot um he bred plot hounds to uh game bred uh game line pit bulls for his catch dogs and uh which is actually a, a common uh, not a common but those f1s like that are usually make from a from a from a hound to a bull breed like that usually make a very great uh a very good running a type of running catch dog mm-hmm. mr mason actually breeds catahoulas uh over dogos and makes cat does a similar type of f1 um but yeah no um we ha- we're we're actually considering starting to starting to do the dogs on a one-by-one basis uh per breeding schedule you, you follow me so so our next breeding we're considering doing dna testing on both the male and female before we go through with it to see what we're looking at right so our our next two candidates for that will be will be dna tested i wish we had the cash to do all the dogs at once but unfortunately it's not going to go um unfortunately it can't go like that i wish right Right. it's a great i think it's a great technology i'm very interested in it i follow i follow it quite a bit i would be interesting to know i would be interested to know how the the profile panel these dogs turned out as to you know they have a lot of where you can it it tells you the percentages of breeds in them Uh i would like to see how how accurate that is on the texas terriers because they're so you know they're fairly outcrossed you know right right Uh, the moms are very uh they're very the moms during the whelping process that's not where we that's not where we have the the issues with them usually that the issue is in breeding we have to select the right female with the right male and we have to be almost right on top of them uh, not going not so far as to use a breeding stand like the old pit bull men do, but um, basically almost assisting the breeding. I'll see if I can find a picture of it for you, Sean. Basically, almost assisting the breeding because the females are so greedy and, and dominant that for them to sit still and be mounted by a male long enough for a successful tie, and sometimes after the tie, they don't like being tied up with the male. So okay. that's a uh, they're they're fantastic mothers. We just uh, you know that's the 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 problem is 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 we have to like I said we have to kind of coach the breeding along, and that's not with every female. That's just with certain females that are, are that are particularly dominant. Man, the um, it's funny because these dogs were you know you have various personality types that run across both the male both male and female. Um, it seems to me though that the females can be a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more on fire. Maybe that's just because that natural drive to provide for the pups and everything is already in them. Uh, the males, the males tend to be a little bit more. Uh, the females tend to be a little bit more reserved, uh, uh, more reserved when it comes to other dogs. The males will seem to seem to work out. It, it, it's almost op- opposite of other dogs. You know, the, the males seem to work out better with other dogs than 
the females do. But once again, it's it's on a dog to dog basis. You know, the Marx Brothers, for example, like I said, that's uh that's the uh, four four brothers, uh, maybe three now. I think Chico passed um, a while back, but um, that's a uh, dogs from the same breeding, and they're actually pinned together and fed together on a, on a daily basis. Uh, Harpo is a little bit food aggressive, so he has to actually be fed out of a not in the community trough, but fed away from the other dogs. Now, if would, would this be you could obviously probably could not this would not be possible with five intact or four intact male dogs, you know. Mm-hmm. This is a uh, like I said. This is dogs. This is dogs. Uh, this is dogs. Dogs hunting pack so that he doesn't endanger any of his genetic stock that's left. Mm-hmm. But um, no, the, the like I say the 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 female dogs seem like I say the female dogs to me seemed a little bit uh, a little bit more. Uh, but they're, they're just a little bit more. Uh, maybe just a touch more dominant than the males. But other than that, they're a very a very similar type. Very affectionate. Like I said, very very affectionate to people. To all, you know, they, they have a. A, a desire to to greet and you know to be accepted by all people you know we don't have an instant we don't have any problems with them um like i said it's, it's amazing you could the first day i met him i handled every one of the marx brothers doc passed him to me over the fence head high right in my face and i never once felt like i was going to get my you know my ear tore off by him <laughs> they were just licking, licking my face you know first thing the first thing first your first meeting of this dog is passed you to the face and it's just licking your face and you put it in the box Ten minutes later, it's loose in the woods, uh, doing its best to, you know, try to try to hunt up a boar for you. Like I said, I fell in love with them straight away. You know, mm-hmm. um, other than other than the females being being very alpha, there's not there being a little more alpha than the males. There's not a whole lot of not a whole lot of difference uh, in, in between the males and females. Uh, what other breeds have you had hands-on experience with? And, and- uh, well, mostly it's been for me, mostly personally, it's been cur dogs. Um, mm-hmm. When I went to make my second foray into hog dogging, the second time around, um, I tried. I was going to try my little my formula again. I went down to the pound. Uh, my first catch dog was a dog that uh, come out of Spindletop, uh, a scatterbred dog named Bruiser. It was a pit, uh, gang, uh, catch weight size pit bull, about seventy five pounds, cold as ice uh, around other dogs. Uh, lived with lived with cats, but he would hunt. Uh, he would hunt gophers on the ground, so I knew he had a nose on him. Anyway, uh, so I've had a good experience with pit bulls i probably cared for I, I wasn't there when the main dogs came over to spindle top so when i was at spindle top i think i was in charge of maybe 14 14 dogs at one time pit bulls and these are all dogs that ran the ran the gambit from game real game bred fighting rescues to paper champion dogs that were titled as a, a search and rescue and things like that uh, so I have, a, I have a decent bit of experience with pit bulls but that's because uh, coming from the south and um, i was around and my my uncles had them friends and family had them so fairly familiar with with pit bulls and but my second foray into hog dogging i go to the shelter to get a this time i go to the shelter to get a, a dog a pit bull and i see a black mouth cur there the original old yellow dog and uh i say oh i recognize it that's a black mouth cur and the ladies at the shelter were overwhelmed you're the first person to recognize the breed would you please take her we've kept her longer than we're supposed to because she's so good and she kennels with little dogs and that's my shotzi dog she's a um Coming on nine years old, black mouth cur dog. I took her home. Uh, the place I lived on had a few acres with some pecan trees, and I set her to protecting the pecan trees from the squirrels. That was her first job, which allowed me to set her on things and call her out. Uh, I gained a handle on her from there. I trained her to blood trail. She found a couple deer for some friends of mine. I don't really do a whole lot of deer hunting. Um, it just doesn't, just doesn't get my blood going. Uh, so she found a few deer for them, and then that's when I took her to Mr. Mason, and we uh, started her on hogs. And she's been a, a hog dog ever since, and that's what she really loves to do. She's an okay squirrel dog, but the, but the squirrels can knock her, which means they can they can lose her. A smart squirrel will jump a tree and can hide and lose her. Mm-hmm. She's decent at it. She's decent at it. She's not a great squirrel dog, but the hog dog, um, she's not rough, but she'll stick with the hog all day. The biggest, uh, the, her biggest asset, and one of the biggest things that can be annoying is that she will roll out, um, meaning that after we get to the hog with the catch dogs, she'll leave us to go find more hogs. You know, one time she rolled out on three separate occasions, and I finally almost practically tackled her when she went to. I caught her at, uh, getting some water at a creek. So <laughs> she's amazing. She's helped. Uh, she's helped dogs from Boston. Uh, all over the place. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that Mr. Mason, when my dog is out there training and there's young dogs, he will, um, you know, if he feels the young dog is the right candidate, he'll ask me if I can bring Shotzi in there to run with them because she's just a, you, you can drop, she's a finished dog, Sean. You can drop her with anybody. And if, if for a young dog, that's what you need to see because she won't even be interested in him. She just leaves out 
and the young dogs were like, well, where does she go? Let's go follow her and see what she's doing. She's a great puppy teacher. And she's retired after this. Um, I don't think I'm going to hunt her next year. I think this is this was it for her. I've hunted her from the hill country to the swamps down here and everywhere in between. And cur dogs, like I said, uh, and I've been around Mr. Mason, who's has cur has Catahoula curs and breeds Catahoula curs. Mr. Mason's Catahoula curs are literally all over America and in Australia and China and Sweden. And he's I can't say enough about Mr. Douglas Mason of uh, out of a. Uh, Oak Ridge uh, Ranch down there in Columbus, Texas. Uh, former president of the Texas Dog Hunters Association. Probably done more for dog hunters in Texas than anybody I can think of. Like I said, on a personal level and on a uh, on a statewide level as far as advocacy for hunting dogs in Texas. Um, still, still at 70, I want to say Mr. Mason is 76 years of age. Still running hog dogs. Still runs his traps every day. He traps hundreds of hogs every year. <laughs> Uh, he's cut from cut from that old cloth sean like the like the lonesome dove cowboys yeah took a hit in the shin one time and uh no emergency from a hog no emergency room necessary just get that iodine and that staple gun and uh <laughs> oh and i'm telling you sean like it made me feel it made me uh check my manhood because he was he was the same his voice his, his voice his voice never changed throughout that his, it was the same tone of voice as if he's explaining to you about dogs or something else, as he's telling you to squeeze the squeeze the meat together on his shins a little tighter for that staple gun. Oh man! <laughs> great, great man, and just a soft spoken guy. The greatest compliment I've ever gotten in the in the dog world to me is when Mr. Mason uh, asked me to come bring my dogs and hunt with him. You know, that's the greatest compliment someone can give you is say, "Hey, bring your dogs and hunt them with my dogs out here on this place. I have permission to hunt." Mm -hmm. You know, that that beats anything. You know, and it's uh. It's one of the few one of the few accolades I can I can wear in, in my brief time in the in the hog dog and dog hunting world. What have you noticed the difference between say a black mouth and a Catalua? Well, you can. It's funny you mention that because it's a topic all the time. I can show you Catahoula bloodlines that throw yellow dogs that we would swear were a black mouth yellow cur, mm -hmm. just maybe not as black around the eyes and the and the mask. Uh, the biggest, the biggest difference I would say is you can get some strains of Catahoulas that are, uh, it seems to be there's more bloodlines of Catahoulas that are rougher on, uh, on stock because they've, over the years, it seems now they've been focusing them more on hogs than on cattle where, um, you can find rough lines of black mouth curs, but it seems like to me, the more of the black mouth curs seem to be a bit more, uh, stock minded. And what I say that is a, uh, a stock minded cur is not going to catch with the catch dog when it gets there. It's probably not going to try to catch a, a hog on its own unless it's a very, very small hog. And it's usually not going to put teeth on a hog unless it's running. And that's a stock minded cur. Shotzi will nip at a hog running, but as soon as it stops, she backs up, you know, a good six to, <laughs> depending upon the size of the hog, six to 10 feet <laughs> and starts baying her head off. And she'll tighten up. I've got good pictures of her baying tight, but she, uh, you know, she's kept herself out of the vet and out of the out of stitches and staples from uh, being really smart. And once again, all that goes to the training she got at Mr. Mason in his uh, wooded pasture and uh, hunting with Mr. Mason and hunting uh, across the state with people. But as far as uh, that's the only uh, the only difference is, like I say, Catahoulas are uh, an amazing breed. And uh, you can find almost anything you want in Catahoula, too. There, uh, there are treeing lines of Catahoulas. There are rough lines of Catahoulas and soft lines of Catahoulas that are more stock minded. There's some Catahoulas that are black and tan that are not the merle, glassy-eyed, pretty dogs that um, that were popular when the Catahoulas went through their phase. But they're sure enough hog dogs and they're sure enough uh, cow dogs as well. And what's interesting about the Catahoula is they are the state dog of Louisiana, but a lot of their integral earliest breedings came here from Texas. Um, Virgil, Virge Cowboy Williams was an integral breeder of the uh, of the Catahoulas here in Texas. And some people say that the Catahoulas go all the way back to Jim Bowie and his brother Resner Bowie, uh, the guy that invented the Bowie knife. They say that his brother, him and his brother, brought the first Catahoulas into Texas because they were from uh, that area, the Catahoula Parish area of Louisiana. So they're interesting dogs, and of course the the black mouth curs they go all the way back to the the Fred Gibson book of Old Yeller, which was actually written about a yellow a black mouth cur uh, back then. And uh, they're still famous dogs to this day. I don't know if if, if, if you read a lot about them, but one you can look if you're interested in uh, Sean is a, is a black mouth cur named Weatherford's Ben, and uh, he's probably one of the most prolific producers. A lot of people who claim that you know that just because your dog has a percentage of Weatherford's Ben in it, it's not going to be a great dog, and that's true. But he was a very consistent producer and a 
very famous dog to read about the Weatherford, uh, the Weatherford system of breeding off is based uh, the Weatherford family of curs at this point, point in time is pretty much based off of Weatherford's bin. Uh, I hope that answered your question about curs. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's mountain curs. A curs basically just a, a curs basically a term for how a dog. It's a, it's a type. It's it's how a dog works its prey. Um, hound dogs bark uh, on trail. You know, most plots are silent on trail. A lot of plots, but a cur is usually not barking until they are looking at the game that they are facing. And in addition to that, cur dogs, I feel, and, and most people, I've, I've got this description from uh, from cur men, is that a cur dog hunts with you, whether they're long, uh, medium, long range, or short range. They make loops and try to locate you and work around you. Whereas hounds get on a trail, and and uh, well, now once a cur gets on a trail, it's gone. But what, hounds in their way of exploring doesn't seem to be as oriented around hunting with you. And I guess that goes back to the fact that the curs were originally an all-purpose settler kind of dog, you know, that you can use to round up your cattle, your free-range cattle, your free-range hogs. And uh, so I, I guess that it, it goes back to that basic type. You know, the mountain curs, and heck, there's there's family lines of curs down here in Texas. Uh, Mr. Par- Mr. Larry Parker of Louisiana, excuse me, not Texas, Mr. Larry Parker of Louisiana, or no, maybe Larry, Mr. Larry is in Texas, but he breeds uh, Parker curs, which are solid black curs that are dedicated hog dogs. Great Another great uh, bloodline or uh, a type of dog to look into, as well as, like I said, there's so many cur dogs, uh, doe belly curs, and just curs that were a lot, family line curs, bred by old families here in Texas and Louisiana, and Florida, the cracker curs, and the mountain curs up there, too, in the Appalachians. They're, they're just a dog that was bred, they're, they're an American type. The word goes all the way back to George Washington, and even the poem, uh, I don't know if you've ever read the poem by Abraham Lincoln, The Bear Hunt. Sean, but you should if you've never read it. <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah, it's an interesting story that Abraham. It's, it's a it's a poem that Abraham Lincoln wrote in the vernacular of the time about the uh, excitement of a bear hunt. No, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I'll let you. Huh. See, I'm a dog. I'm a dog nerd, just like you, Sean. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear about. You know, I'm not a hunter, and you know, I'm a, I'm a city slicker, but you know, I, I lived in small town. Uh, right central texas south central texas oh get out where at come on tell me uh uh, right on the border of uh bastrop and lee county i lived in a small small town called page texas which is off of highway highway 290 i know exactly i know where bastrop is i don't know i've seen page i've seen signs for page i've never been there but i know i know what you're talking about yeah basically page has got a uh a post office box (laughs) and i think i think there's a lady that runs a sandwich shop out of her house. <laughs> I know, I know the type of town you're talking about. Yeah. They uh, they roll up the sidewalks at night. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good little Texas town for you. That's great. Yeah, uh, the Guthries, the Guthries can claim it. They can get to where, the, where they'll they'll claim it, that some uh, particular one will want to claim a kill. Uh, once again, a lot of times that goes along with testosterone. So if you have a if you have a male dog that's intact, um, I'll give you an example. Though the last time, the, the first time we hunted Jake's dog in the field, you know, uh, my 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 catch dog is intact. We hunted him with uh, Chester, who's intact, and there there wasn't an issue. But it's, it is something that you'd have to watch for. But they're not they're not overly bad about it. I'll send you a video of the last good decent hunt that Jake had, and it's got all five, I think all four or five dogs. Uh, worry in the head of this hog together at the same time and nobody and that's the thing is if you can keep them on the if you can keep them engaged on something if you keep them engaged in their job then you don't have a problem but like say say you had a hunt and the catch dog missed or the catch dog or the hog broke and now you now things are scattered when you're gathering up dogs every once in a while you know you just you, you want to keep an eye out but they're not um i i don't it's not something that we look for once again i'll send you you know the Marx Brothers are just great. I'll send you a video of my catch dog and Jake's catch dog and all the Marx Brothers riding together in the back of a pitch, pickup truck. Now, the dogs are all tied on leads, you know what I mean? But still, that's something that's something that I probably, that, that not many, you know, most people have dog boxes for a reason. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> you know, you can't box every dog with every other dog, but we've managed to integrate these dogs together, and I don't feel that, uh, now, it, once again, if the dogs are, you know, they, they you, have, you have certain individuals who do like to fence fight maybe a little bit, um, but once again, that's usually just a, a matter of a, of a dog that's a little frustrated and needs to get exercised. And or we'll move them around and find a dog that for whatever reason they like the way that dog smells and maybe they don't fist fight them. But it's not an overly it's not an over it's not an overly well being issue, something you have to be on guard with all the time. However, like with any dog that has a high drive, um, yeah, 
claiming a kill probably and a little little dominance displays but like i said doc keeps the march brothers in the same pen together you know so it's it's uh it's there but it's not something that we obsess about you know what i mean right it is there it's something we maintain an awareness of that's a, that's a, that's the thing we maintain awareness of and we look for we look for dominant displays you know that's the thing is most people don't don't do that barney fife thing and nip it in the bud and that's the whole thing with that stuff you have to stop it before it starts because because by the time it starts it's too late yeah so yeah, yeah breaking up a dog fight is no one's favorite and i hadn't ha- i haven't had to do that yet with the texas terriers i'll put it that way the future we'd like to envision for them is, uh, is we're, once again, we're also considering going with a registration, looking at outside registration organizations, but we have to get the type set first and uh, get our, get our fertility up just a, just a notch. Once we get our fertility up a notch and we start DNA testing our studs and, and our, and our, and our dams, uh, we, we would just like to make more awareness of these dogs and how we feel that as the, uh, See, the average size of property in, in places like Texas is sinking, is, is shrinking, where people would once own several thousands acres, now they own several hundreds, and the people that used to own several hundred acres now own 40 or 50 or 60 acres. And as the size of property shrink, the, the need for a long-range dog to kind of be a, a, a property guardian or, or a, 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 a vermin dog, or as you if you will, is you don't really need a – and that's what we feel that as a – as America move, makes a rural move, this type of dog would be really important in that if for people who want to change their lifestyle like that mm-hmm. in the proper hands once again. So we're going to continue working on, on testing and, and uh, exploring our options with, uh, with the back crossing and, recro- and, and, and out crossing. Like I said, not adding anything new that's not, out, that's not already in the recipe, but just being very selective at what we put into the recipe and then testing it and testing it and testing it again until we're certain that this is what we want. Like I say, we want to keep to Red's uh, strict, you know, everything Red did was, you know, was, was very, was very thought out and calculated and he didn't, he didn't jump in it, jump in anything. He didn't breed something and say, well, let's just see what happens. They're all calculated moves. And so that's what we're t- trying to do so that we don't bring any unwanted traits into the genetics because there's a saying in dog breeding, you know, once you put something in, you can't take it out. It's always there. Right. And so that's our that's our goal is just to just to get our, our our genome a little a little a little you know refreshed on the female side, and to explore our options as, as to what we need to do, and then and then like I said, make these dogs uh, a little bit more aware in the public in the public sphere, and who knows maybe maybe ten years from now uh, down the line it'll be pop it'll be possible for anybody in America to, who in a rural area who needed to own a Guthrie or needed you know could own one of these guys. Like, like I said, they're just absolutely fan, fantastic jam up little dogs. As a matter of fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and invite you, Sean, next time you make your way down to the state, if you can, give me some heads up notice and maybe we can set something up. You can come by and take a look at it, maybe even take a walk in the field with us with them. Oh, see if we definitely. Can, I'd love that. See if we can get a bark. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We'd love that. Yeah, she's very, they're very moldable. I'll put it to you that way. The, uh, Red had every, people use them, like I say, from everything from squirrels to wild hogs. And uh, they're very, they're very moldable in the right hands. You know, but they um, once again, just like a Patterdale or any other high dry dog, like a Malinois, even they're gonna they need an outlet. They need to be fulfilled. Or by gosh, they'll make your life, uh, you know, <laughs> make you make your life something you wish you had started raising goldfish. Right. right. Um, how are they with water? They're they're actually very good swimmers. Um, the first hunt that we ever went on with Doc um, after the hunt was over. His lead dog, uh, Chester and Tebow, which was Tebow, that was Tebow's first time in the field. Uh, Chester actually led Tebow uh, to water, and then the rest of the dogs went to water. And uh, they're they're decent swimmers. The long haired coats probably could use a shave if they're going to swim a swim um swim any any great distances. But we're not planning on bringing any ducks back. Um, for short distances, uh, Doc's dog TT can keep up with his 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 his, his, uh, his retriever dog, his uh, his lab. But they're, they're they're not they're um you know I wouldn't say they're they're not water dogs but they definitely don't have any problems with it. You know? mm-hmm. What is your favorite breed of dog that you've never owned or handled but are interested in and why? Oh, wow, that's a good one, man. Sean, that's a really good mm-hmm. one. Um, man, I would have to say it would it would be something. Uh, I've never messed with a bird dog yet. That's the only thing I've never done is a bird dog. And I would like to see if, um, you know, they, uh, 
you know, something like a German short hair pointer, something like that. Uh, I've never, the bird dog mentality is something I've never re- tried to, uh, never tried to understand the bird dog mentality and, and get into their heads and work on I think they're awesome, fascinating. They, they, you know, they, look, they look so trainable and so driven. Uh, Doc's uh, retriever, Mac, is the only bird dog I've ever even spent time around. And, uh, yeah, it would have to be something like a German short hair pointer, you know. Uh, I think that that would be the one for me. I uh, a good looking dog that could that could that could work birds and I don't know if you know this but the, the German um the German bloodlines of those German short hair pointers, uh, to get their field certifications are also required to be able to handle small game. Um small vermin game. So that a lot of times the German short hair pointers, um, the really rowdy ones make great hot dogs too. So I would really be interested in, in working a German short hair pointer and, and, and getting an idea on how they think and watching them in the field. Yeah. I I had a buddy that uh he had a couple, and um, uh, he lost one because it engaged with a uh, mountain lion in Central Oregon. So that, that's that's what I've heard about them. I've heard that the ones that are on fire are on fire. Yeah, yeah. Bird the bird bull cross is another cross that's fairly popular um, in a lot of places. You know that 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 takes some of the uh, takes some of the dog aggression out of your bull breeds if you need a catch dog and, yeah. and gives them a little bit of nose and a little more wind too. Yeah. I've, I've often thought about that. And to be honest, I've often wondered how much the pointers were used in the dogo. Uh, my catch dog, he's uh, what's called an Amerigo. He's a six generation product, uh, a six generation product of, a, of out crossing and back crossing uh, between dogos and American bulldogs from the Scott lineage. And he's just a, he was the odd throw out of the litter. He was the only one that was a, uh, fawn and white but he has ticking on his coats that almost look like an english pointer it's ridiculous interesting yeah the americos are a really interesting uh interesting project as well they were started by the ugly dog ranch here in uh in texas uh, they they uh they started this this crossing back and forth of the dogos and the and the american bulldogs and uh, every other generation they would go back to a full-blooded bulldog or a full-blooded dogo and they're uh i love mine he's he's jam up dog kid friendly uh, minimal, no dog aggression. I mean, he'll if he's if he's attacked, he'll engage, but he's not interested in a dog fight at all. Right. Just a great hoss is a hoss is a great all around dog. I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for a better dog. Hard mouth dog uh, broke a canine off at nine months. Wow! Just a, oh yeah, he's uh, nickname is Meathead. Most that's most people's first comment when they see him. He's got a really nice headpiece on him for a, for a dog that doesn't weigh ninety pounds. For a companion, I'll tell you what, um, oh, I, gosh, I can't think of Jake's name. Uh, there's a gentleman named Jake who uh, is a, a good friend of Mr. Mason's. He's a dog trainer out of Colorado, and I had never been around a really nice um, English staffie before. And Jake has an English staffie named Willie who is just a jam-up little dog. I mean, he's just great. He uh, he, he has a, a the, the, the great little attitude of, uh, you know, the, the the, the attitude that you want in a, in a bully breed of, of, of a greeter type when people are around, you know what I mean? He, he wants to greet people, but Jake has such a, a really good handle on him that he can he can go anywhere and be, you know, he'll place and stay that dog anywhere. But as far as his temperament, that for companion dogs, I, I, that's what I would like to, that's what I'd like to look at is, is, a, is a real, a decent bloodline of English staffy. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, a lot of those dog guys, man, it's hard to say because even like with Red, we're finding out a lot of, you know, but some, some of the things are lost in his breeding program. And, and, and But that, those are the things in the past. We have all the recent information, but, you know, the dog world is so uh, was so secretive at some points in time. I'm trying to think of, I think Maurice Carver was the guy who said, uh, just because I bake you a cake doesn't mean to have to tell you what's in it. Right, you know. right. Thank you for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank it. you, man. It's, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. I enjoyed yep. myself, man. You're a good interviewer. Thank you very much. All right, later, Sean. Bye.